gosh, I, I feel like I should begin by talking about what is biosemiotics, uh, what is a biosemiotician. Uh, but I'll leave that other than to say uh, every living thing lives by interpreting the world around it, by generating some kind of subjective image of the world around it. And the central feature of this, and it applies directly to discussions of science and religion, is that we commonly like to think that we make interpretations of the world. Um, people often like to think that they choose what they believe. Um, but it turns out that the evidence often indicates that the interpretations make us. A past me looked at the world, believed something about the world, that is to say, perceived it in a particular way, uh, read the world in a particular way, and then that reading reconstructs my being. Not only mentally, but through the processes of evolution, physiologically. Um, biological mechanisms are semiotically realized is a central argument of biosemiotics, and pretty much everything follows from that. Um, in applying this to religion and the question of science and religion, um, I'm actually going to go back and touch on something our last speaker just talked about. And uh, I, I think that our views are rather compatible, although they're coming from some different angles. Um, the argument that there is no such thing as religion, that there are only religions and a plethora of them, um, one could almost, one could reasonably argue, as does Trevor Ling, a uh, uh, significant philosopher of religion uh, of a generation ago, uh, that there is such a thing as what he calls common religion, which is to say your particular set of rituals and practices your particular set of belief structures. And if there are you know, 100 people in this room, there are probably something like 150 religions uh, because our beliefs are not coherent. Um, and that that is part of the function of belief. But the previous speaker, I would argue, is entirely correct when there is such a thing, or I implied it was part of the presentation, that there is such a thing as a function of religion. And I think that that is what religion is. It is a process. The things we call religions are social institutions, books, dogmas, cathedrals, that result from this process of religion. What is this process of religion? Um, it is largely a matter of interpretation. You see something, you, you make sense out of it, you, you have sensory data that generates a mental image of the world which you believe, which is to say you act on so as to further your life. Um, it is fundamentally biological. Religion is about how what you believe becomes how you behave, which becomes who you are. Uh, my own interests, generally, I don't care about what people say they believe. I'm interested in what they do. Um, and, and by uh, gathering data about what they do, uh, for example, how many people say they go to church versus how many people are counted walking into those buildings on any given Sunday. Uh, in America, the difference is enormous because it's socially acceptable to go to church and not acceptable not to. And so in many studies I've seen, it's been as high as 30, 35% difference between people who say they go to church and people who actually show up at church. So that, again, I don't really care about what people say they do. Um, let me jump forward. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I have a, a series of arguments. Uh, much of what I'm going to present today, I have published in various essays. Uh, you can find them online at Academia or Research Gate. It usually has to do with uh, biology, cognition, belief structures, religion, uh, semiotics. Um, you can speak with me afterwards and I'll hand off references. Um, and I, I'm not going to cite many of the people that I reference. Uh, Except perhaps a few if their arguments are particularly important. 
Um, in the abstract that I wrote, uh, the idea that conventional notions of religion place it beyond the range of empirical study. Yes, it does. The religiously minded tend to describe it as a kind of a telescope. There's something beyond the perceptive ability of this particular species, but we have this tool, uh, this dogma, this set of this Bible, these, these rituals and practices that allow us access to experience that thing that is otherwise undetectable. Um, but of course, the fact that religious perception shows no consistency beyond that of a common culture, we can pretty much simply reject that idea. Um, rather, as I said before, I think believing is a matter of biology. And therefore, religious behavior is fundamentally animal behavior. Um, it's animals who have uncontested faith. It's animals who see and believe. I've had countless conversations with religious fundamentalists. Um, you see, you might notice in my bio biography, um, in my own experience growing up uh, in an extremely fundamentalist family in a working class district in a small city in the middle of the States, um, I'm talking about my family. I'm talking about everyone I knew as a child. Uh, and I'm talking about people that I still go visit regularly. And having conversations with these people, and hearing the stories, oh, these scientists, these liberal professors, I'm sorry, who are you talking to? <laughs> these, they have no evidence. They just believe, same as us. But we, the difference is we have evidence. Oh, really? What is evidence? Oh, the Bible. No, I don't mean what is your evidence. I mean, what is evidence? And almost always I get the answer. It's seeing and knowing. It's like, no, that's perception. That's not evidence. That's what animals do. That's what they see, they believe, they act. They throw themselves into Darwin's jungle, and so do religious people. Um, so what is believing? I've already talked about that. What is the relationship be between believing and knowing? We're going to get to that in a minute. And it really starts with imagination. I will argue that you cannot perceive a thing you can that you cannot imagine. Um, a person, an individual, a living thing, is limited in their imagining, in their imaging of the world. But as we know from Darwinian biology, uh, constraints are actually opportunities. Constraints channel behavior. Um, what, do we, what is believing is a propensity to action. What is religion is a channeling of this propensity to action. So that there's a series of, oh, I should say, a complex of beliefs, a belief system uh, that drives behavior. How you, what you believe becomes how you behave, which becomes who you are. Um, in religion, the central questions of religion are all of epistemology. In all their bewildering variety, religions postulate truth claims. And their inherence ground their behavior and the perceived validity of those truth claims. And to a believer, their religion is that telescope that I refer to. Uh, for the non-believer, <laughs> it's not a telescope, it's a kaleidoscope. A bewildering array of colors that simply make no sense whatsoever. I mean, My paper's out of order. Just to go with me. So many arguments. So many arguments. So, what you see when you look out on the world is limited to your imagination, as I said. Imagination allows belief to happen, belief allows knowledge to happen. You cannot know something is true and not believe it is true at the same time. 
So knowledge is a subset of belief. We have to believe in the scientific process before we can access the scientific process. And we have to imagine the scientific process before we can believe the scientific process. So what is imagination? Um, well, imagination begins with imaging. It's the generation of an image. It continues only so long as that image is maintained by a mind. That mind may be remarkably complex and symbolically derived such as many human beings, most of all, such as human beings, it might be very simple, rather primitive, an adult tick, perhaps, to use a famous example. Um, the tick builds its representation of the world with only three significant sensory uh, data, pieces of data. Um, the sense of up and down, the sense of warmth and cold, and the odor of butric acid, which is a product of mammalian hair fall. Uh, the sublime and primitive animal will climb to any available perch and wait until some source of butric acid wanders underneath of it, and then it drops. Darwin's jungle. Accident. Maybe it will land on a, a mammal. Maybe not. Maybe it will survive. Maybe not. It has no way of testing to see if there is an animal underneath of it that it will land on. It simply drops. It acts on its belief in a future state, and that is to say, in its image of the world, projecting a future state. It needs no eyes to imagine the world. If it happens to land on an animal, it will use its sense of up and down to climb up. It will use its sense of warm and cold to find the warmest spot available where the blood is closest to the surface. It will feed. It will survive. So imagination is a product of science. Um, as I understand it, it's ubiquitous to biology. It happens whenever any living thing minds, that is to say, interprets its world around it. That's the first sense of imagination that I, that I think is inherent to all living things, including human beings. Um, a second sense of imagination is also ubiquitous to life and inherent to all living things. And it's the process by which we access the adjacent possible, to steal a phrase from Stuart Kaufman. Um, a living thing can be identified uh, by their ability to access some available resource. Uh, Bertrand Russell famously called life chemical imperialism. We are a chemical reaction. We are a series of chemical reactions that are going on coherently. But unlike a non-living chemical reaction, we can go find more chemicals to sustain our reaction. That means we read the world so as to find things we can eat and avoid being eaten by things that we want to eat us. Um, this is actually a very dangerous thing once it becomes cross matched to the third kind of imagination. The third kind of imagination uh, entails symbolic abstraction. And we'll get to that in a minute. But what I want to point out is, as living things, we tend to generalize, and then we tend to abstract them symbolically. Us, humans, as opposed to non-living things. I mean, uh, as opposed to, excuse me. <coughs> I woke up this morning rather ill, so you'll have to forgive me, I hope, if I pause and cough. I've already had cough syrup, I've already had half a dozen cough drops. I'm going to make it through this, but please be patient. <laughs> All right. Some homeopathic pills. Oh. No. <laughs> Do you have any? No. Homeopathic? No. Okay. No. I don't really believe in that anyway. So the 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 function of belief will not help me because I don't I actually don't know how to believe in it. But that's a different conversation. Um, imagination is the construction of a symbolic edifice. Imagination as when a child plays with imaginary friend or goes on adventures with his toy dinosaurs. We call that child imaginative. And in this sense, imagination refers to the generation of an entirely speculative, normally specious, small world. <laughs> to steal a phrase from Dr. Echo, rather interesting biosyncretician and novelist. Um, fictions, myths, stories that we use to explain our experiences to ourselves. Stories by which we access the adjacent possible. Stories by which we image the world around us. 
Stories that are imaginative. One could even call them religious. Stories by which we channel our interpretation into action. Um, well, a good example of the problem with that is where I live, there's a really gorgeous kind of mushroom called Cherubinamuko Merka. It's rather poisonous. And it's bright red and beautiful. And the person who enjoys a delicious, juicy red apple and then goes and eats a handful of delicious, juicy red strawberries and draws the conclusion that red is healthy. So they're walking in a forest and they find this beautiful red mushroom and very shortly thereafter they are dead. Because it doesn't work that way. Because when we draw these abstractions and generalize uh, broadly away from the specific, uh, the specific entity, the specific phenomenon, the specific thing, uh, we very easily and very readily go wrong. So the second kind of imagination, the first and second kind of imagination, um, we have to remember that the image of the world that we see is not what we see, it, it's not what, rather, it's not what there is, it's what is, what is available to us according to our sense perceptions. The second kind of imagination, the accessing of the adjacent possible, um, it's possible, it's, it's necessary for biology because we have to see a future state of having a full belly. Um, we have to see a possible future, a full stomach, within a current reality, the size of potential food. Uh, and this becomes a game, in a technical sense, that is played by all living things. For example, one of my favorite examples of this has to do with a study that's been done repeatedly, which is of foxes and rabbits. When a fox is hunting a rabbit, he doesn't behave like a dog. He's not just running around. He doesn't have a bowl of dog food at home ready to go to. He has to invest his energy wisely or he'll starve to death. Rabbits can run faster than foxes. When a fox is chasing a rabbit, he doesn't chase the rabbit, he sneaks up. And when the rabbit sees the fox, if the rabbit sees the fox before the fox gets to the rabbit, the rabbit doesn't run away. He stands up on his hind legs and looks at the fox. I see you. And what does the fox do? Does he run real fast after the rabbit? No. He, you know, ah, shh, gosh, go down. And he goes off and looks for some other rabbit. Right? Because the fox cannot imagine catching the rabbit. It doesn't fit its past experience. It doesn't, it doesn't function well. And the rabbit doesn't need to run away because he knows he can escape. He knows. He, doesn't, he might not know that he knows, but he knows. <laughs> Um, so these three kinds of imagination, the imaging, just the act of imaging the world, and of course by imaging I don't mean visual representation, I mean subjectivity, which is ubiquitous to all of the things from amoeba to mankind. Um, this sense in which imagination is a uh, tool by which we access some possible future, those are ubiquitous to life. The third one appears to be relatively limited um, and actually uncommon even among homo sapiens. Uh, but that's a whole other argument. Um, but if you cannot imagine a thing, you cannot perceive it. And that goes for all three of these bound up methods of imagining bound up together. Um, but because humans cannot not perceive through the powerful medium of symbols, so this, the color red, standing for something delicious. And because symbols are a kind of postbiotic life form, what I mean by that is not some crazy boom. What I mean by that is uh, symbols take on new meanings as they're reproduced. Symbols that do not function iconically standing for a class of things. They do not function indexically pointing to some specific identity. The meaning of a symbol is derived from its history of usage. 
which means it's a matter of reproduction with variation plus selection, because the, what a symbol means to you is going to be different from what it means to me. I can share a symbol with you, but you will interpret it slightly different. You will reproduce the meaning of that symbol in a way slightly different than how I use it. Um, so symbols can take on a life of their own. Science in this way can function symbolically, can take on a meaning all of its own. And now we get to pseudosciences, and now we get to the use of science to prove the validity of, to use a common example, the Gospels, which is always quite funny. Um, in the last several hundred years, uh, religious methodology has often begun to ape, if I can use a, uh, that term, um, science. With the proof of the New Testament, the fact of some ancient cities in Judea. The proof of Spider-Man, the fact that New York exists. Never mind that. Um, that leads us back to science and what it is it that we do when we do science. Um, it's important to remember that science cannot replace religion. Science does not replace the channeling of interpretation. Science cannot replace the function of belief in shaping our behavior. Since belief is just that propensity to action, if you believe it will rain, you're more likely to carry an umbrella. If you believe that scientific methodology can lead you to a better understanding of actuality, you're more likely to engage in it. If you believe that evidence is necessary because our perceptions are often wrong, you're more likely to search for evidence beyond mere perception. But science does not command, nor does it complete, this process by which interpretation becomes knowledge. But it does further it. So in many ways, the scientific method is a consequence, and the origination, both the origination and the practice, and belief in scientific method, is a consequence in the belief of the need to check our ideas against reality. Because we might be wrong. Um, now, science has become an integral part of the human biological niche. Which is to say the part of the world that humanity can survive within. Um, and the behavior that shapes and is shaped by this human niche is not formed simply by making stuff up and calling it true because every living thing does that. But it's also made possible by living according to the strictures of the assigning. Our attention goes not only to the sign object but also to the sign. At our best, we believe our imaginings to be true but simultaneously, simultaneously see them as historically contrived fictions. Within the scientific method, we recognize that a theory stands only so far as the evidence will carry it. And we have to recognize, or we fail in science, science readily becomes pseudoscience, when we stop and say, no, no, we have all the known facts, we're done. No, we need to further our interpretation and recognize that theories are going to be overturned. So we recognize that our, our, our knowledge is something that we made up. We make up a story, we call it true, but at our best we recognize um, that it is a historically contrived fiction. Our best puts science to work. At our worst, we imagine we have ended the need to check our map against anything that the processes that generate our mental maps are somehow exact and our mappings, if not our maps, complete. Our worst turns words, symbols, theories, ideas, beliefs into fiat decrees, answering words, as James liked to put it. Where we just say, how does this happen, God? What is that energy? We're done. Oh, we have an answer. We're finished. Our niche is more a product of our minding of the world than that of any other known species, but that's a difference of degree, not kind. Our niche grows as we imagine it as being, more limited by minding than by matter. And our minding is extensive and accurate. Science does work, and yet the territory remains larger than the map. 
It has to remain larger than the mouth. Because in living things, this, what subjectivity does is function, metaphorically speaking, as a map to guide the living thing around in the world. But if you have a map of this beautiful city that contains all of the information of the city in full scale, well, you would be as lost in the map as you are in the city. The map would not function. If the map contained the same degree of information as the territory, it cannot function as a map. And therefore, all of our mindings are incomplete. All of our science is incomplete. All of our knowledge is limited. And now we're back to belief. You cannot just decide what you believe. You have to, you, you can, however, manipulate your beliefs. So, I like to say that all living things practice religion. Um, how does it, do we have any evidence of that? Do we have any evidence of a, of a direct connection between, say, uh, the belief system of an amoeba and that of a human being? Well, there's a, um, there's a study that's been done numerous times by numerous people. If you just Google glucose gra amoeba glucose gradient, you'll find a thousand different variations on the same study. Um, an amoeba practices religion exactly as a human being does, with his deeds. Um, if you take a large pile of artificial sugar, and a very small pile of real sugar, and you release a series of amoebas into the controlled environment, uh, many of them will begin swimming towards this, the real sugar, but uh, an amoeba, of course, a little put his on in the head, it has a, sensor, a chemical sensor on the front that can sense sugars, it has a flagellum, uh, when it does not sense sugars, the flagellum just rests and it just bounces around according to the winds and weather or whatever. Uh, when it senses sugar, it spins its flagellum and drives it towards the sugar. And as it, if it senses more sugar on this side of its sensor, it will drive itself towards more sugar. It will swim up the glucose gradient to the largest pile of sugar. In almost every case, the amoebas ignore the small pile of real sugar, go to the large pile of artificial sugar, because it believes the lie, because it's greedy. Because it, 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 it imagines a future state, lots of children, lots of, you know, a good life with a big pile of sugar. Yeah? One of Umberto Eco's, one of my favorite definitions of life comes from Umberto Eco. A life begins when lying becomes possible. Uh, religion begins when lying becomes possible. Um, So, the practice of religion is a consequence of this ongoing transcendence into being. It's a, it's a consequence of the way in which interpretation is channeled and becomes actuality. Three minutes left. All right. And now I really ready now. So, um, summarizing in three minutes. Um, that we have, okay. Because of our skill at symbolic abstraction, because of our developed skill at scientific methodology, because we have developed functional techniques of testing our ideas against the actual world, but also testing our ideas against our ideas to see how well this map works as a map. In other words, because we have developed science and philosophy, we have found ways of bypassing danger. Animals, and I would argue those who, humans of, maybe are animals, but a human animal who is of a particularly religious bent, they throw themselves into Darwin's jungle. They have no way of testing if what they, their, their mapping of the world fits the actual world. Um, that we have developed these abilities is amazing. Biological adaptation. However, we human animals have also carried, simultaneously carry a naturally evolved potential uh, 
Uh, let me start that again. We human animals carry a naturally evolved potential to intend novelty by systematically eliminating dysfunctional notions by means of a methodological artifice, science, and philosophy. We can test the safety of a water hole at no risk to life or limb. There may be an alligator, there may be a parasite. We can find out before we go up and stick our head in the water. That we have also developed a socially heritable system of refusing to make use of this ability. And, honored the, and we honor this refusal with names like duty, faith, principle, God, religion. And therefore, we allow our unreckoning, we allow our irrationality, both of which are fundamentally biological, um, to ground our talks of virtue, goodness, and actuality itself. We think we actually see something looking through that telescope. We think the kaleidoscope makes sense. Now, as I see it, uh, much of what has come to be called religious is in fact a refusal to rebind oneself, a refusal to test our interpretations, a refusal to even attempt to understand what is going on with our perceptions. Generally speaking, of course, to be religious means to refuse to question or allow questions of my own psychological, tribal, and more cultural abstractions so as to maintain a preferential notion of myself, parasite to know, alligator or no. To be religious is to just dunk your head into a water hole and let what happens, happens. To be skeptical is to recognize there might actually be parasites in that water hole. There might actually be alligators in that water hole. And maybe it would be a good idea to find out before we stick our head in it and start drinking. I have time left. I have two minutes left. Oh, four? Oh. I have a half minute left. <laughs> what can I say in 30 seconds? Um, there's a whole lot more that I would like to say about this, actually. But uh, 30 seconds isn't enough to do it. Um, in short, um, the religious imagination in living things, um, belief is biological. Religion is biological. Epistemology is biological. Um, human beings are fundamentally of the same kind as all other animals. Our species-specific map, our ability to make stuff up and call it true, even though we know we made it up. That's what we need to focus on and develop as skeptics of the Because um, that I don't like, I, well, I'm a religious person. I interpret things. I believe things. I act on the things that I believe. I cannot actually control <laughs> what I believe simply by power of will, right? But I can influence my belief. I can analyze the consequences of my belief. And by doing so, I can come to believe better, yeah? I would argue that that is what doing religion actually consists of. I would argue that uh, Charles Darwin, renowned atheist, at a time when atheism could really cause him some social damage, in a place where his atheism could really, really cause him social and economic damage, um, a man who never had any real problem saying, yeah, I don't believe in that stuff. Um, didn't make a big deal out of it, but just didn't believe it. I would argue that he was more religious than any of his detractors. And I would argue that religious fundamentalism, which is the refusal to recognize the fact of interpretation, a religious fundamentalist says, oh no, I'm not interpreting this book. I'm just telling you what God says. This isn't my understanding of the Bible. I'm telling you what God says. No, no, you're telling me what you think this fictional character that you've made in your small world says. Can you show me any evidence? No, 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 a whole other conversation. No. By, by acting on his beliefs to allow them to transcend themselves into further being, to, to act on your beliefs in such a way to find out if they actually co are 
coherent and logical, to act on your beliefs to find out if they correspond to something in reality. Not merely to use them and then discover too late that they were wrong and now you're dead. You think you can fly? Don't start by jumping off the top of the building. Start by jumping off of a small table. And if it doesn't work, don't jump off the top of the building. It's pretty much that simple. That's a matter of testing your beliefs systematically and methodologically so that you can believe better. And I would argue that that is a product of the religious imagination in living things. And what we human beings can do is step out of Darwin's jungle, avoid some of the worst excesses of natural selection, find out if there's a parasite or an alligator in that water hole before we stick our head in it. And that's what I call a skeptical thinking. Oh. Well, we also have questions in the session, but thank you very much.